in my mind's eye. All you need is love. <laughs> Kenobi. All you need is love. Happy day. We can be Kenobi! As the Kenobi series comes to an end, we close on another chapter in the story of Star Wars. As everyone runs to talk about Andor the Bad Batch, or why this series was either the best thing Star Wars has ever done, or the thing that broke them worse than getting trapped in the middle of Utah after dark. <laughs> I wanted to sit with the Obi-Wan Kenobi series a little bit longer because while certain things didn't work for me, a lot of things did. More than what didn't. How Obi-Wan's guilt and depression from failing to save Anakin from his own darkness broke and hollowed him out to the point that he might as well have died on Mustafar with him. It's been 10 years. He lost his entire culture and he's a wreck, living in a cave, dealing with night terrors and looking like he hasn't showered in years. He's basically anyone who survived 2020. The way Reaver's character became an exploration of trauma and how the abuse and the violence she suffered in her youth shaped her into something unrecognizable. One of the most unexpected things I loved about the series was being able to see how far Owen and Baru would go to protect Luke. Star Wars has had a lackluster history with families, odd given how it's the go-to thing most people associate the franchise with, but outside of Luke, Leia, and Anakin's relationship, most families in the live-action Star Wars stories really never have been involved in the the main story beyond background support, so it was interesting to see Owen and Baru defend Luke with their lives. Also, we finally got to know what it takes for Baru to go full John Wick on an angry Sith. For the sake of this joke, we're going to pretend that Reva is a Sith. I know she's an Inquisitor, I know, calm down Star Wars nerds, but the joke has been said. We're through the looking glass here, people. The Kenobi series, largely in part thanks to the best acting across the board from the main cast in the Star Wars show, directed by Deborah Cho, who is given a disrespectfully low budget, and a crew that still was kinda green behind the ears, and the Pixar legend Andrew Stanton, who came in to save the series with his late rewrites, has become one of my favorite stories in the Disney era of Star Wars. That doesn't mean that it's without flaws though. In truth, the Kenobi series represents the best and worst of what Disney Star Wars has to offer. This likely explains why the discourse run in the series is very much like the sequels. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Some people just can't look past the flaws of the series and see what it did have to offer and the beauty it did bring to Star Wars in its own right. Likewise, there are some people who refuse to see any flaws and insist that almost any criticism to be had with the series is minor nitpicks at best and toxic fan entitlement at worst. Now, I don't think either mindset is fair or healthy media analysis. This conversation is pretty ironic to me given that this is a show dedicated to the prequel trilogy. A trilogy with many flaws of its own that once upon a time was frowned upon with only its flaws being put into consideration. Yet as time went on, it grew such a strong following that well that Disney Lucasfilm would open its purse and make an entire series that basically functioned as an epilogue to that trilogy. There are moments in the series that I consider to be some of the best of the franchise. Story beats that remind me why I once fell in love with Disney Star Wars. Yes, 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 yes. Yes! and what I wanted to see from the future of this franchise once upon a time. There are moments of loving sincerity. Can't you make this thing go any faster? It's a trade route, Leia. I'm not in control of it. Can't you use force on it or something? That's not how it works. How does it work? What does it feel like? Have you ever been afraid of the dark? How does it feel when you turn on the light? I feel safe. Yes, it feels like that. Of what it means to be family. If anything goes wrong, you you know what to do. You run. I'm not afraid. I know. Everything's gonna be fine. It's gonna be okay. Uh, you really love the boy. Like he's your own. He is my own. and the soul-crushing devastation as a character realizes that some people may be beyond saving. Anakin's gone. I am what remains. I am not your failure, Obi-Wan. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. 
then we have a cathartic closure to another character saving themselves from their own darkness, thus showing the character who could not save his own friend that there is hope out there for some people. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. He killed them all and I couldn't do it. You haven't failed them by showing mercy. <laughs> you have given them peace. You have honored them. Have I become him? No. You have chosen not to. Then there are moments that don't make much sense that exist solely for the sake of spectacle, scratching those member berries. Looking at you, episode 4. And the series creates plot contrivance after plot contrivance for the sake of having concepts that either don't make sense under logical in universe scrutiny or are literally just taken out of the story altogether. As much praise as I can give the Kenobi series for certain aspects of it, the corporate fatigue of Disney Lucasfilm is on full display here. Kenobi at times feels like it represents what we've seen in Star Wars time and time again over the last decade. And despite all of that, I somehow walked away from the Kenobi series feeling a sense of closure with my relationship with Disney Star Wars and the characters in this series. Flaws and all, I ended up loving the series a lot. Being able to accept it for what I didn't like and love it completely for what I enjoyed. Strange given the last time this happened I was demoralized to the point of not even knowing how I felt about Star Wars anymore. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Before slowly accepting it for what it was, even though I didn't really enjoy the ride to get there. Like the series, life is strange. No, not the game. Bro, you got sidelined in your own film. And no, this is just Moulin Rouge. You, you, you know what? You know what? Let's just start the video. No, that is Birds of Prey. Okay, no, that's just Revenge. Of, you, know, you know what? Close enough, close enough. Let's just, let, let's just move on. When the series begins, we are treated to your obligatory Order 66 trauma because this franchise knows that anyone who's seen the prequel trilogy now has that moment scarred into their brain. And damn it, Lucasfilm is gonna use that trauma to fuel that emotional damage. The number of times Order 66 has been used in Star Wars has basically become a meme at this point. Boy, that escalated quickly. But in all fairness, in universe, Order 66 is one of the most defining moments in not just the Jedi's history, but the entire galaxy. It would be like writing a story in close proximity to World War II. No matter who you are or what your culture is, Order 66 and the rise of the Empire is engraved in the history of the galaxy and you kind of can't ignore it. It's that important. And it's not just there to be there. Order 66 in this story is deeply personal for the two main characters of the series. And let's talk about those two main characters. Ben Kenobi, played by Ewan McGregor for the first time since Revenge of the Sith. Well, technically, he was in The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker as a voice, but that's technically, he's physically there in all his physical glory. Oh. And Riva Savande. And Reva Savander, a Star Wars newcomer played by Moses Ingram. Now, if you're only going by the marketing, trailers, interviews, fan wanking, and there is a lot of fan wanking, including from me, you would be right in thinking the actual two main characters of the Kenobi series were Old Ben and Vader, which is something I'd chug up to Lucasfilm's odd marketing, which recently has been rather bad, and on the rare times it does exist, just, well, just weird. Don't get me wrong, Vader is in the series, but in all honesty, he serves as an over overarching big bad for the Kenobi story, and an antagonist for Reva, there's no arc for him. There really can't be any arc for Vader because he is emotionally locked in continuity as not growing or getting worse as a person until Empire Strikes Back. He's mostly just a big, angry black ball of rage who's either following someone else's orders or being a menace to society. The most you can do with Vader is what most other Star Wars stories these days do with him when they want to cash in on the Vader love card. I'm gonna fuck you up. Have 
him randomly terrorize people or make people he used to know emotionally damaged. And well, this show has decided to do both. So the bulk of the heavy lifting of the series is done by Obi-Wan Kenobi and Reva, both of which are on their own healing journey because of the events of Order 66, Anakin's betrayal and the rise of the Empire. Reva was a youngling at the temple and the first time we've seen someone who was a direct victim of Anakin's betrayal as a POV character, and not one of his friends, his family, or a close associate, which is pretty new. We've never had that before in the shows or movies. It's always Ahsoka, Kenobi, Luke, Padme, Satine, Sabine. So when her past is revealed to Kenobi, it's a nail in the coffin that Kenobi has placed Anakin inside his head. Even though his friend is alive, the horrible things he's done weighs heavily on Kenobi for training him, not being able to save him, and finally, not killing him. We had the chance on Mustafar. And all of this happens because of one baby Leia. That's right, we have another baby. Another one, thank you. Another one, thank you. Another one, thank you. Another one, thank you. Because what type of monster hates kids? Oh, well, besides Anakin, he's in... Oh, 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 okay, besides Anakin when he's in full panicking mode. So when baby Leia is kidnapped, Bail Organa breaks into Obi-Wan's hut and tells him it's time for his spinoff to happen and he needs to get his ass off Tatooine. Now, Kenobi is confused because he was told that his spinoff would be more of a somber, low-scale story set on Tatooine as he dealt with his trauma and watched over Luke from afar while training with Qui-Gon Jinn and trying to go from sexy Ewan McGregor to dashing Alec Guinness in. But Bail tells Kenobi that Lucasfilm and original Kenobi screenplay writer Hussein Amani, who also wrote the romantic comedy Drive. Joby Harold has taken his place, and Boba Fett, for some reason, had his entire adventure set on Tatooine. Like a panther. So now Kenobi needs to get his beautiful ass off of this desert planet ASAP. So we're off on a planet hopping adventure. Kenobi rescues Leia from the set of Breaking Bad, runs into Kingo from the Eternals, Eternals assemble. watches as Reva makes a million rebel fans lose their collective sanity, though these days Lucasfilm themselves seem to be doing that on the regular since they're taking forever to make an animated sequel to Rebels, and no, the Ahsoka series does not count. That's a personal spinoff from Ahsoka's POV, like the rest of these character titled spinoffs, okay? Nope, don't do it. Don't do it. It's not. It's not a rebel sequel. We'll fight you. I'll get the cloning boy to fight you. He probably will fight you. So in episode three, the budget runs out and we find ourselves in the empty field somewhere in California. Hayden Christians is there, looking for the farmer's market, of course, and wondering if Chad May wants to hang out after Love and Thunder. They get picked up by the guy from Scrubs and Kenobi's IQ lowers just a little bit so we can have a pointless action scene and an emotionally well-acted scene between Kenobi and Baby Leia. This happens a lot in the series, a weird line between pointless and beautiful, but whatever, we're moving on. Before Kenobi, Kenobi can get captured again, he is saved by Ilaria Sand, who has escaped Game of Thrones Season 8 while she could. The Inquisitors, who have been inquisiting at the Inquisitorius thingy-mabobby, track down Kenobi with Big Papa Vader. We get a mid-2010s fan film fight, Baby Leia gets kidnapped, again, and Kenobi gets to know what it feels like to be a space rotisserie chicken. The next episode starts with Kenobi waking up with the people of the path, a potential Star Wars spinoff with Ice Cube's son, O'Shea Jackson. This guy with the blue hat, th 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 he looks kind of familiar. These other guys that also look strangely familiar. And Wade, the most important character in the entire series. Do not forget Wade. We love Wade. He is the most important character in this entire franchise. Do not forget, Wade. Kenobi goes to rescue Leia, again. So the writers boot up Fallen Order and we have our usual Star Wars infiltration mission that we've literally seen in almost every single Star Wars project. Kenobi rescues Leia, proves that the Empire learned nothing from Joker over there. No, not that one. No, not that one. No, not that one. The one they can't legally call the Joker without Warner Brothers suing them. The show creates Twitter slash TikTok discourse Wade dies. The entire Star Wars community needs to go to therapy after losing him. And Hayden Christensen comes in to create one of the best Star Wars memes ever. You were born. What the feet? The next episode kicks off with Pixar writer Andrew Stanton breaking into Lucasfilm to save the Kenobi series and I'm 95% sure John Favreau left the door open. And look, he's brought back Panikin and he's even angrier and blacker than ever somehow. And he's looking like a prequel snack. The production budget begins to go up and down at random points in the episode, no one knows why. Yet the gut-wrenching action from across the board and the much more character-focused writing does wonders for dragging back the people who were beginning to lose faith in the show and thankfully ending like 
lots of fandom debates. God damn, this was getting annoying every single week. You don't like stories, my friend. You just want your Glup Shadow. Glup Shadow happens. Oh my god, this is the best series ever. Both of you guys shut up and watch the show. Vader and Reva have a breakdancing fight. He reminds her that he's still in his Rogue One beast mode. The Grand Inquisitor randomly walks back into the plot as the other two disappear from the plot. Hello. Mostly because she didn't say anything and he has to be in the next Fast and the Furious film before Vin Diesel comes to his home screaming about family. And Rebels fans were already on their 13th reason why they did not need another one. Reva gets stabbed by Vader again but since no one's ever really gone and since Darth Maul seems to be the only person who knows how to penetrate people and kill them from it, Reva survives and is able to hear Bail Organa leave a voicemail with Luke Skywalker's IP address because Kenobi did not call him back. Bail, you need to chill, you are clinging your clingy bail. The Kenobi finale, which without me even making light of it, is the best of the series. It's heartbreaking, brutal, filled with lots of emotional moments, and heart that I haven't seen in Star Wars in many years. It felt really sincere. Vader vs Kenobi, while still shot like an expensive fan film, is one of the most emotional fights in the entire franchise. Hayden's terrifying, deranged, rage-filled performance mixed with Ewan's soul-crushing despair is sold perfectly and with so much genuine hurt and honesty that it was better than the fight i'm gonna be honest when i watched the fight i'm like oh yay i'm I, I'm watching the finale of The Last Airbender mixed with The Matrix, but when we actually get to see what everyone came for, Hayden and Ewan being able to act off each other instead of their stunt doubles being thrown around in a very dimly lit scene that you need to turn the exposure up, it's heartbreaking and that's all anyone ever wanted. Tatooine is the real heart of the episode and the series as a whole, Beru and Owen doing everything in their power to keep Luke safe. Their son safe is one of the most powerful displays of love in Star Wars. In the franchise, we We've never really gotten much from either Baru or Owen, but it's admirable to see them both so strong and steadfast in their youth to protect the boy they never had to take in, but they did. There's a beautiful moment, one of my favorite moments in the franchise, when Reva realizes that Owen and Baru love Luke like he's their own, which makes Owen reply. This one moment elevates the entire series, and it pretty much shows that Baru, Owen, and Luke definitely should have been at least a B-plot that was involved in the series so we could see more of this relationship, more of this dynamic. Reva chases Luke into the desert, and we have a really disturbing scene of her hunting him, going in for the kill, then having PTSD flashbacks to when Anakin tried to kill her. All of this is brutally depicted and kind of really fucked up at times. Refusing to kill Luke, we were brings him back to his family and has an emotional and mental breakdown. The trauma and grief finally gain to her. The mask of the Inquisitor has fallen, and all that's left is a broken woman whose pain has become too much to bear. Kenobi consoles her, showing her a tender side that only comes after you've had to deal with a couple of young ones in your life. Reva being the fourth, we're counting. Kenobi helps Reva take control of her own grief. The two share a moment, as both of them are finally able to move on from the trauma that Order 66 has caused them. The pain's still there. The trauma is always going to be there as well but they're able to move on from that singular moment and try to build a life for themselves outside of there. Riva goes her own way to find her own life. Kenobi regains a sense of self and he gets to teach Luke Skywalker the power of memes. Qui-Gon leaves his farm to meet up with Obi-Wan Kenobi at the end of the series and help him find the script to his spin-off film that Bob Iger killed. And that's the story of Kenobi. Now, I'm not gonna pretend like I don't have any criticism over Kenobi. I do. I have a good deal. So if you want to know that criticism, jump to this time skip right here. And if you don't, just sit back and relax and listen to the praise. As many things come into question about Leia being kidnapped by the Empire, and later being a known traitor due to helping Obi-Wan Kenobi, which is a giant issue we will get into later, the dynamic between Baby Leia and Obi-Wan is the highlight of the series. Both actors have great chemistry, and even if it's become an overdone, tired trope in Disney, Disney Star Wars, the haunted man finding a form of redemption through taking care of a child is a formula that does work, even with its flaws. That's why they keep using it. Yes, it's tired and overdone, but you can't knock its results. Hayden Christensen is amazing in this series and people have really taken to him too, which is good to see after the unimaginable hate he got for the prequel trilogy. What little we actually do get of Hayden in this series shows how comfortable he is in the role of Anakin, from playing the youthful, arrogant version from Attack of the Clones, the physically haunted and troubled version from Revenge of the Sith 
Sith and the imposing dominant Vader. And the deranged broken man beneath the helmet, Hayden has a lot of range as the character. He always did. People just really didn't appreciate it back then. What the Kenobi series lacks in its visuals, it makes up for tenfold with its acting. It doesn't matter if it's the veteran actor Ewan McGregor, the criminally underrated Indira Rama, or the always solid Joel Egerton. Everyone is doing their best. Newcomer Moses Ingram made me feel the feels. Vivian Blair does a great job as the mini firecracker baby Leia. On Brewer's John Wick was not something I was expecting to see in Kenobi, but it is great to see you back in Star Wars, Miss Bonnie. Jimmy Smith and Simone Kessel are great as Leia's mother and father but like the Lars family i really wish we got more of the best episode of the series is definitely the finale and it is exactly what people wanted from the kenobi series which was the Lars, kenobi and how far both of them will go to protect luke the vader rematch was okay and the way reva and obi-wan both come to a mutual sense of closure about their trauma is handled in a sensitive and mature way the kenobi series is far from perfect but there is a sincerity and genuineness to how it plays up with obi-wan and i would say out of everything in the series obi-wan's arc is the best thing in the series it's the thing that makes or breaks the entire show okay now let's get into the flaws to say the kenobi series has flaws would be an understatement now don't get me wrong i wouldn't say it's as bad as the book of boba fett no offense to the book of boba fett fans i love the people who made it i love the actors who are in it but the story in the show itself is like the overall story of kenobi isn't all around terrible but its production value feels like it's somehow worse than the book of boba fett the cinematography goes from good to fan film depending on what i would assume would be the budget deborah cho was given per episode which given the inconsistent quality of kenobi i would assume not 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 that much not that much the first two episodes of kenobi look pretty good the series continues the grounded gritty brown feeling of rogue one little cd little is and i think it works for the first two episodes when kenobi is on you know tatooine and everything's dog shit because you know his life is dog shit as well and then when we get to the gritty seedy disgusting crime world that looks like it's out breaking bad it also works there too but there's no variety the color is very meh the problem is that this look this feeling never leaves a series no matter where the show goes in fact it seems to double down and get worse as time goes on we lose more color we lose fucking exposure a while it doesn't have the vast creativity in terms of world design and art direction like the prequel trilogy worlds nor does it have the jaw-dropping scale or visual of the sequel trilogy worlds in terms of cinematography or well visuals sequel trilogy praise may not be that welcome on the internet these days but in terms of visuals and cinematography the sequel trilogy was rather impressive, especially the rise of Skywalker, which may be the current punching bag of the sequel trilogy due to the writing, which I'm sorry, The Last Jedi is right there as well. But its directing and cinematography is arguably the best of the franchise, right next to Rogue One, The Empire Strikes Back, and Revenge of the Sith. That's right, I said it, J.J. Abrams is one of the best directors. Say what you want about his writing, but the man can direct a scene. Just, you know, uh, ch chill, chill out with the lens flash, J.J. Just chill, just a little bit. Oh, okay, okay, you did chill out. Nice. Nice one, lads. Yet in Kenobi, the cinematography almost feels fan film, utilizing filming techniques that don't seem to fit the story or scene. And in general, the show has this fan like quality of it. Like Disney gave Cho not only a small budget, but a crew of people who did not have working equipment or that much experience doing what they did. And if they did, not very good experience. I feel really bad for Cho because she has made a lot of great stuff in her career. And well, this doesn't look up to quality that she's done in other stuff. Oh! <laughs> 
narratively the series has problems. While everyone online seems to argue about Reva or Leia taking up screen time, I find the biggest problem with Kenobi's plot structure ironically is neither of them but Darth Vader. Darth Vader is a great character, don't get me wrong, not just one of the best characters in Star Wars but one of the best characters in film history itself. The problem here is there isn't much room or development between Vader and Ben, even if you think they're rematch of the century as it's been called by multiple people, there's not much there. Not until the mask breaks and we can see Panikin. Hayden Christensen. Hayden Christensen's Anakin has a lot to offer the character of Vader, but the mask Vader doesn't have much. We know Vader can't kill Kenobi and will still hate him at the time of A New Hope. We know Ben has given up hope on Vader and will go back into hiding. They're locked in continuity. Ironically, you could take out every Vader scene from this series, except for episode 5 and 6, and the series because of that would be better. It would have more time to focus on the other important stuff in the series and also make sense with the later twist in the series, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll come back to you later, Annie. I, I I, I gotta talk about Reva and Obi Wan. Okay, okay. He, he's mad. Uh, we'll, we'll just can, can, can someone throw Anakin a Capri Sun? It's a recurring joke in my friend group that I always like to say: concepts do not exist without context. Which is basically what I mean, regardless of how good or bad a concept is. If it's not tied to the context of the character in the story, it doesn't mean anything. And sometimes the Kenobi series disregards context for the sake of concepts. Like, for example, let's just say a certain god. Inquisitor, who has the most gorgeous face, decides that she wants to go all America on Luke Skywalker and send him to the Qui-Gon farm. Well, first Obi-Wan needs to hop on his space camel, ride it off into the desert, hopefully find his lightsaber buried somewhere in the sand dunes because we all know sand doesn't shift at all over time, hop back on his space camel and on the off chance that Reva hasn't already sent Luke to the Qui-Gon farm to meet Corky Kenobi so he can ask him about the parentage of his father, whoever that may be, Reva can quickly kill him and, of course, send Luke to the Qui-Gon farm at that point because he's definitely dead. The concept of having Kenobi in this physically weakened state in his lightsaber buried is to position Kenobi as the physical underdog. No one is saying you can't have Ben dealing with trauma and self-doubt to the point that it is hurting him physically and how he protects Luke, but you need to do it in a way that doesn't betray the context of why Ben is even on Tatooine in the first place. This isn't me saying Ben needs to be doing backflips like he's Tony Hawk on death sticks, but it's me saying you need a balance of how far this depression is going to destroy him. Now, many people will say that Obi-Wan being in this weakened state of not training is putting the character before the spectacle, but the resolution and the reasoning behind Kenobi not training is solved through spectacle, which is somewhat paradoxical. It was done to position him as a physical underdog, and it's resolved by showing him as a physical powerhouse. Leia getting kidnapped in order to lure Kenobi out is interesting, though an execution terrible in almost every way, and in theory raises more problems by involving Kenobi than appealing to the Imperial Senate, which probably sh shouldn't have been able to happen in the first place given that Bail Nobu One's literal one job was to protect the children, but sending the most wanted Jedi in the galaxy to get one kid would raise more questions than ever. You have to ask yourself if most of the Empire knew, which they definitely did by the ending of Kenobi, that all you needed to do was to lure him out would be to put one of the Organas in danger, why did they just never do it again? Why did they even let them become part of the Imperial Senate that we know they both are later in the films? There's also this missed opportunity of letting this grief-stricken broken man who's been living in a cave express his frustrations with his old friend, how in 10 years of living in this miserable desert, by himself, Luke has been in no danger, but Bail in a castle full of servants and guards couldn't keep one little girl safe. Kenobi is reluctant to leave, and then Bail challenges him that it's not about the boy, which is making him not want to leave, it's about his own guilt. Which again, as guilty as Obi-Wan is for what happened to Anakin, the sole reason he is on Tatooine is to watch over Luke. Leaving Luke alone is a dangerous thing, especially since Inquisitors were just on Tatooine, and as far as Bale and Obi-Wan are concerned, what happened to Leia is completely unrelated. So, sending Obi-Wan away could and does cause a second conflict in the series of there no one being there to protect Luke. And I'm not saying Obi-Wan can't leave anyway because he feels like one of the twins is in greater danger than the other, but it's the fact that he doesn't get to express the agency of his mission to take care of Luke. Luke is just pushed to the side. Reva is an example of the best and worst parts of Kenobi. Ironically, it has nothing to do with the character or the actress Moses Ingram, but how the series handles her relationship with Vader. Moses gives one of the best performances in the series, but that's when she's allowed to even give 
a performance. The series really doesn't know what to do with Reva until the last two episodes. She comes in, she comes out of the show, sometimes only appearing for maybe a minute or two and doing not much except for saying dialogue and doing things that contradict with a later plot twist. As much as people like to claim she took over the show, when watching the series back, I was actually surprised how limited screen time she had. Across the entire series, Reva only had around 39-38 minutes of screen time in the entire show. That's six episodes. Frustratingly, this pushback against Reva is due to Vader and the duel of the century being terribly overhyped in the marketing and by Lucasfilm, when in actuality Vader himself only appears for 22 minutes in the series series, most of which come from the last two episodes, which in my humble opinion are the only episodes Vader was needed in. You didn't need him. In episode 2, 3, 4, they should have spent that time fleshing out the other characters. Vader is a character who works in small doses because of the impact, so when he does appear it's like holy fuck. How you doing Orphan Annie? How's the wife? I stole that joke from Michaela. The show was marketed as the Obi-Wan vs Vader show. Vader is on all the posters, Hayden is giving almost as many interviews as you and sometimes even more interviews, and the trailers treat Vader as the sole importance of the series in relation to Kenobi. But ironically, the Vader concept of this show is the fan film spectacle aspect of it. The one that every single prequel trilogy kid wanted in their head, but it's actually conflicting with the emotional story that the original writer and the later writers are trying to do with Reva, who in comparison to Vader gets little in terms of marketing in the trailers, not even on one of the posters beyond her character poster, and is eventually pushed to the side with a lot of the online marketing due to Hayden bringing in more of the clicks. Now don't get me wrong, I love Hayden, I love Panikin, beautiful, beautiful man. But the problem is here, when Reva is the emotional center of your story, when she's the actual antagonist of the story, and you are spending a good deal of time hiding her in every single which way, it's going to send the wrong message to the people who are looking at the marketing, listening to the interviews and everything else in between, I'm like, okay, this is the Obi-Wan Invader show. And then there's Reva, this person you've been hiding the entire time, and they're just like, okay, okay who is this? This, is, this? this wasn't what you said I was going to get. It's one of those problems where the Lucasfilm marketing and, well, the Lucasfilm everything doesn't match up with what they're giving people. In comparison to Fallen Order, and yes, we are going to compare this to Fallen Order because Kenobi borrows ridiculous amounts from that game, this concept with the antagonist being an Inquisitor is done much better. It's average from the beginning that Trilla would be the antagonist of the game, and like any antagonist, the confrontation there is the emotional center of the series. Vader, as impactful as he is in his appearance in Fallen Order, at the end of the day is only there to service a little bit of the story and have some spectacle, which again is what he is in the Kenobi series. Don't get me wrong, when we get to see Panic and his mask off, it is emotional, but most of the series is from Obi-Wan and Reva's perspective. But the big difference is, Fallen Order doesn't try to hide what it's doing. The Kenobi series Series, even if it's just in its marketing, its advertisement, and well, everything involving the series, hypes it up to be the Vader vs. Kenobi series, which it's not. It's about Obi-Wan's trauma about Anakin and Reva's trauma about Anakin. It's a catch-22 doing that in the Kenobi series since clearly Lucasfilm wants to capitalize on the return of Hayden Christensen and the possibility of Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi throwing hands again. Yet by hyperfixating on that, the Reva storyline, which is deeply important to Obi-Wan's arc in the heart of the series, is seen as something that is hijacking the action figures throwing rocks at each other instead of the actual point of the series. Now don't get me wrong, I enjoy seeing Anakin and Obi-Wan fight, but there's nothing that can happen in that fight that changes the course of the future of these two characters. So to hyper focus on that when we all know how the confrontation has to end, instead of the actual heart of the series, you're not only marketing the series wrong, you're doing yourself no favors when people walk into your story like, hey, you said it was this, but it's that, and you were aggressively saying it was this. There's another problem with Reva, and that's the lack of ambiguity surrounding her character. Now, she is a former youngling who survived Order 66 and is now trying to kill Darth Vader because of what he did to her back in the day. The only problem is her climbing the ranks of the Empire, dealing with more really great choices in order to get where she needed to be, and the physical and emotional conflict she suffers from having to work with the people who destroyed her life and wanted her dead at one point, is never seen until episode 5. In every other episode that Reva is seen in, in fact, there are times when she is lecturing the other Inquisitors that they are too soft and weak, that they need to be more like her her more vicious and savage. Now, if I was a generous person and wanted to do the work for the writers, I would say this is her doing a very good ruse, and she was doing everything in her power 
hard to stay on the cover but that's not what happened and that's not what it looks like what it looks like is what it is multiple people were writing for kenobi at different stages of the production and they kept certain scenes in concept with reva but they changed the context so things no longer made sense so the context and concepts behind like the first two appearances of reva do not make sense with her other appearances and the context for other scenes which again if you change the context for certain things you need to change the concepts because they no longer work and if you change the concepts you need to change the context they go hand in hand you can't have concepts without context and you can't have context without concepts i will be saying that to the damn in the grave man as we know from other films and shows within star wars changes will be made and sometimes it makes motivations and actions be thrown into questions because of those changes they don't make sense with the new concepts but the existence of a recurring problem within star wars does not justify the repeated problem just because there were retcons in the original trilogy that made other parts of the original trilogy make less sense doesn't mean you should go okay well we're just gonna keep making things weird you, no you you need to learn from the mistakes of the past from lucasfilm influencers to employees the go-to response to any criticism these days is to play the what aboutism game and point to a flaw or a dumb thing in an older entry of the franchise or even the mistakes george lucas himself personally made and act like the existence of those flaws those problems just erases all criticism and now we the discourse surrounding kenobi was absolutely fucking miserable every single week i wanted to bang my head against the computer because it was just too groups of hyperbolic star wars fans yelling about dumb shit and not talking about anything you had the bigoted racist neckbeard misogynist motherfuckers of the fandom on one side yelling and crying and screaming at the sight of a woman or obi-wan just doing anything that portrayed him as someone going through depression and then you have the other side of the fandom that refuses to acknowledge any flaws or criticism whatsoever and it's something i personally can't subscribe to listen i've made lots of friends with the star wars community but if there's one problem the fandom has as a whole it's letting certain Lucasfilm employees and influencers gaslight them into never criticizing anything in Star Wars. It's corporate propaganda, something not even George Lucas believed in since constructive criticism, not blind, large media hate, was what helped him go from The Phantom Menace to Revenge of the Sith. It was feedback from his peers, feedback from people who actually did love what he did in Star Wars, but said, hey, you can improve this by this, that, and the third. Mature and humble creators can admit when they've gone too far in some places and wish they were able to do things better but the more egotistical creators are the ones that can't accept any criticism and have to constantly compare to other shit and be petty about it the culture war surrounding analytical criticism and thematic enjoyment is honestly why the star wars community has become so petty and argumentative it's the reason why the only vocal people in the community are the ones who see different opinions regarding star wars as a declaration of war disney star wars has not been perfect in many ways it's been lesser to what lucasfilm produced before disney bought them in other ways Disney Star Wars has done wonders no one ever expected from Lucasfilm at all after being sold to Disney. We've gotten stories that have made people fall in love with Star Wars and Disney, characters that people hold close to their hearts just as tightly as the original or prequel trilogy characters. The Kenobi series brought the culture war back to the surface of things, where it wasn't about if the series was good or if the series was bad, it was about either it was perfect, the best Star Wars has ever been, or it was a flawed mess with no redeeming qualities and you goddamn better be sure to pick one of those two sides. In truth, like many things Disney Star Wars, maybe even more so, the Kenobi show has a lot of good and bad to offer fans of Star Wars and the character itself. And in the end, it all comes down to you if you felt like the experience, that journey, that story with Obi-Wan Kenobi was worth your time. Or maybe you would have been better off if you just hadn't watched it. When we reach the final moments of Kenobi, after the goodbyes have been had, our antagonist has chosen a new path for herself, our bigger bads line up to the status quo and positions they are in in the original trilogy, and the other characters go back to their normal life. We are left with Obi-Wan Kenobi wandering into the desert. This time though, he's met with a familiar face, Qui-Gon Jinn, which for many hardcore prequel fans is something they've always wanted to see. Even more so if you knew the fact that Qui-Gon Jinn was always supposed to appear again in the prequel trilogy but was never able to due to schedule conflicts. I would have liked to see Qui-Gon in the series more to see how him and Obi-Wan would deal with the loss of Anakin and how they would come back for that. But in the end, even though I considered a giant missed opportunity, I was glad I got to see them together
together in some way since I thought it would be impossible at this point. I guess this would also be a good time to tell you about what the Kenobi films were actually going to be about. What's that? I said films? As in multiple, not singular? In an exclusive interview with the director Nathan Johnson, Obi-Wan Kenobi writer Stuart Betty talked about his role in making the Ewan McGregor starring project and how it was originally imagined as a full trilogy. Betty was credited as the writer for episode 1, 2, 3, and the season finale of the series. Betty revealed that he only wrote the screenplay for the original feature film that the show was based on and never collaborated with the series writers, while also mentioning Solo's box of performance as the reason for the Kenobi movie never getting made. Right, so not at all. None. I wrote the film that they based the show on, so yeah, I spent like a year, year and a half working on it. And then, when the decision was made to not make any more spin-off films after Solo came out, I left the project and went on to do other things. Joby came on and took my scripts and turned it from two hours into six, so I did not work with them at all. I just got credit for the episodes because it was all my stuff. Betty also revealed that his original story pitch to Lucasfilm in 2016 involved convincing them of three stories for Obi-Wan Kenobi, the first of which ended up becoming the series' first season, and the second that looked ahead to the Jedi Master's lead up to A New Hope. So when I pitched my Obi-Wan story to Lucasfilm, I said, there's actually three stories here, because there's three different evolutions that the character has to make in order to go from Obi-Wan to Ben, and the first one was the first movie, which was the shows, which was surrendered to the will of the force. Transport your will, surrender your will, leave the kid alone. So then the second movie was thinking about where Kenobi ends up, and one of the most powerful and probably the most powerful moments in all of Obi-Wan's story is the moment where he sacrifices himself in A New Hope. Great moment, you know, makes you cry, but if you stop and think about it, it's a pretty sudden thing to just kind of go be fighting a guy to see Luke and go, I'm gonna die. You know, that to me, that required forethought, that required pre-acceptance that this was going to happen. The writer continued to elaborate on what he envisioned for a second story of Obi-Wan Kenobi, describing how it would deal with Ewan McGregor's character coming to terms with his own mortality, to divulge into Obi-Wan's sacrifice in his climactic Death Star battle against Darth Vader. So again, it's one of those universal things we all struggle with, to come to terms with our own mortality. So that was the second step in the evolution for me, that Obi-Wan now has to come to terms with his own mortality. Somehow in a prophecy or Qui-Gon telling him, there's going to come a moment where you're gonna have to sacrifice yourself for the good. And the Obi-Wan is like, what? No, no, no. I'm here to help. I can't know. And get him to the proper point where Obi-Wan has accepted the idea that he's going to die. And that he's going to die willingly as a crucial moment. And we all know that moment presents itself. So that that when that moment comes up in A New Hope, you understand. He's recognizing he's been on this journey already and he's waiting for this moment. And that how he's been able to make it so easy to do this sacrifice and to die. So that to me was a second evolution, the second film, the second story. So for me, if I have anything to do with the second season of Obi-Wan, that's the character evolution that I would take him on. That to me is really interesting and like I said, universal. When asked if the three stories that he had planned meant that the plan was to make three movies, Betty confirmed there was originally a full trilogy. The writer also revealed that both Lucasfilm and McGregor were on board with this idea. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Ewan was on board. Everyone. We were like, yeah, ready to go. And we were all excited about it, too. It's a great story to tell, right? It's such a fitting character, and Ewan is just a fantastic actor. And he's a perfect age, everything. Betty was devastated when he found that the project was no longer going ahead as a movie. It was just dying to be done, you know? Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it was Solo that changed the direction of the system. I like Solo personally, but it hadn't made a lot of money. It is crazy in some ways to think about it. It was directed by one of the best filmmakers working today, but just because it didn't hit a certain number, they had to rethink, and again, way above my pay grade, but it certainly crushed us. Devastated, absolutely devastated. But that's the business, you know, highs and lows. I'm glad it got made. I'm glad the show got made. I'm proud of my story that got told. I'm glad my characters are all through it. And and I'm glad I got credit for it. I wish, I wish they'd been able to make my movies though. Stewart would then go on to talk about Reva and her original plans in the Kenobi film. When asked if Reva was in the early drafts of the movie script, Betty said she was my creation. I created Reva all the way through. He continued by discussing Reva's view on the Jedi as villains and how the character originally had no knowledge of Anakin being Darth Vader. Yeah, except the only difference in mine is that she didn't know Darth Vader was Anakin because I was like, how'd she know that, right? All she saw was Anakin as Anakin 
skin again because he hadn't changed into the suit yet. So Anakin killed her friends, put the scar on her, almost killed her, left her for dead basically. So in her mind, the Jedi Council were the biggest villains in the galaxy. She believed the lies that they were plotting a coup to overtake and get power and all of that. But they were stopped by the clones, so she believed that's why she's hunting Jedi, because she believed the Jedi are the worst basically. Stewart went on to talk about Reva's original fate with the story ending with her dying at the hands of Vader in order to save Obi-Wan Kenobi. Be because I figured, how would she know that this thing in a mechanical suit that everyone calls Darth Vader is the guy who killed her or tried to kill her? So it was Obi-Wan Kenobi kind of letting her in on the secret and that relevation that makes her kind of go, oh my god, I've been wrong this whole time. And so she goes on basically to save Kenobi by sacrificing herself, telling Vader, I killed Kenobi, and then Vader killed her, with her knowing that Vader would kill her. So that, so that kind of completed her arc. So just a little bit different than she was. Yeah, absolutely. The Inquisitor hunting Kenobi all the way through and driven by her own personal demons. Stewart also mentioned that while he thought the third sister had a vital role to play in the story, he felt she had to die. Yeah, killed by Vader at the end of it. Yeah, I wanted this story. I wanted her story to end. I wanted Reva to play her part in the Kenobi Vader story, which was essentially at the end. She was the only one that allowed Vader, basically told Vader, to stop hunting Kenobi. You know, she ended the obsession Vader had with Kenobi. She claimed it was over, it was done. So that was, that was her role to play. And she's done so many terrible things, I felt she had to die. Laughs. You only can redeem so much. The writer also confirmed that the original plan for Obi-Wan Kenobi didn't include the other Inquisitors, just Reva. So no other plans to include any other Inquisitors. I knew I wanted Darth Vader, obviously, as the big overall villain in the story. And I see him as the antagonist who was going to be more one-on-one -on -one with Obi-Wan throughout the show. So Reva was the only result of that. I knew I I needed that character. Stewart continued to describe how exploring the fall of Order 66 helped inform Reva's character and take her to a place of understanding. And of course, there are so many great characters from the Purge, the Great Purge of the Temple and everything. It was just like, okay, let's see what she was doing at the Purge. What if she saw everything that went down? What if Anakin slash Vader killed her, left her for dead, and sent her on this path? So all this kind of stuff just kind of made sense and allowed me to create a very confused, conflicted, blinded character filled with hate and rage and all the stuff that makes people want to be a Sith and a Sith acolyte and take her to a place of understanding, understanding truth, understanding who Obi-Wan Kenobi is, who Vader really is, and what her path is in the galaxy. The Obi-Wan Kenobi writer also touched on the struggle of bringing stakes to a prequel project involving Darth Vader and Obi-Wan and how Reva could allow for McGregor's character to have some Someone to defend and someone to save. We were always faced with the fact that Obi-Wan could never kill Darth Vader, so he needed to defeat someone, and so Reva was my attempt to give him someone to defeat or someone to save, because he's not going to save Darth. The Darth Vader storyline is going to end in a downer, so I wanted to save someone, and that's why I created Reva. Some fans have drawn the comparison between the third sister with one of her fellow Inquisitors, second sister from Jedi Fallen Order, who has a similar backstory and arc to Reva. When asked about Reva's potential connection to Trillis and Duri, Stewie revealed that the third sister was created before the video game was even released. So I hadn't played Fallen Order. I wrote this initially in 2017, so that was before I played Fallen Order, and then I played Fallen Order and was like, oh wow, this is Reva. No, look, it's just a coincidence. I wanted to create a new character because I didn't want to be bound by any canon with any others that have already been discussed. I wanted freedom to take her where I wanted to take her. So that's why I created her for this story. And that's the other thing too. We're already using so many characters in established canon canon with Obi-Wan, Darth, Owen, Beru, so I was looking to create someone new. I even had Cody in mind, you know, so I was looking to create someone new. Huh, so Trello was based off Reva. Interesting. As I said before, Kenobi represents a lot of the best and worst of Disney Star Wars for me. It was a spin-off that should have been treated as a flagship film, something handled with care and given the budget to tell the best story it could have been. Instead of a project, Disney Lucasfilm seemed to have no idea what to do with by the end of it, yet despite every criticism criticism I have labeled against the series. The story of Kenobi ends in a place where I'm personally content and, dare I say it, satisfied with how it ends, with how this era of Star Wars ends. For me personally, confession time, I haven't really enjoyed Star Wars for a long time. I mean completely enjoyed something. Yeah, there's been moments I've enjoyed across the board, yet I haven't found myself loving something in a very long time.
long time. I didn't enjoy The Last Jedi at all. Beyond some scarce moments between actors I appreciate, and The Rise of Skywalker, while I admire it greatly for its phenomenal directing and trying to make the best of literally the worst possible situations, it was really my thing either. The last thing I've loved in Star Wars was The Force Awakens, Rogue One, Rebels, Clone Wars Season 7, Star Wars Visions, the finale of The Mandalorian Season 2 before The Book of Boba Fett destroyed that completely, and now the Kenobi series, despite all its glaring flaws. If something impressive comes along, sure, I'll cover it, I'll talk about it, but at the moment, I think I'm done waiting for Star Wars to go beyond the state it's been in since 2017. For many people who have been following Star Wars since before Disney and after Disney bought it, the Kenobi series represents the end of an era, even if there is a second season. This was the last story for a George Lucas legacy character. I feel like no one really knows where to take Star Wars at the moment. Some think endless legacy characters solve every problem, others think just creating new characters who by default like the Rogue One or the Mandalorian characters will eventually become legacy characters after their first appearance. It doesn't matter if something is new, if nothing of value is done with it. Likewise, if something is familiar, what makes Star Wars isn't set principles of what something is or isn't. What makes it great is like what makes any story great. A story told from the heart that does its best in how it's presented and executed, regardless of if we've seen the concept before a million times or if we've never seen it before. Star Wars is in an odd place right now. The shows, while enjoyable, are clearly here to fill a gap in content and provide a reason for the Disney Plus streaming service to exist exist, while also as Lucasfilm struggles to figure out what the fuck they are doing with the films, and it doesn't seem like they really know, as we keep hearing announcements, delays, announcements, delays, things getting moved over, and then just we wait years as time goes on. As much good as the Disney Plus shows have done, it doesn't feel like they've been doing much beyond treading water, and their saving grace was that initially they were more consistent and less troubled than the sequel trilogy in terms of their story. Now though, it feels like some how the shows have become just as inconsistent and at times derivative as the films were criticized to be. I reached a point in my Star Wars journey where I'm not that interested in the direction the franchise is going. For lots of personal reasons, I'm not calling it objectively bad and I'm definitely not calling it objectively good. I'm just saying for me, I haven't been interested in the future of Star Wars because I don't know when there will be a future of Star Wars. Right now it feels like the franchise is in stagnation as it just figures out what's its next next step gonna be. What I'm interested in when it comes to Star Wars is also pretty niche. The characters I care about are gone or in a weird limbo state. The types of stories being made all seem to be cut from the same cloth and for me, while aspects of them I enjoy, the majority of everything hasn't just stuck out to me, it's just been white noise. So for me, being able to see Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan Kenobi and Hayden Christensen's Ink and Skywalker be reunited one last time, as well as one of my favorite new characters with Moses Ingram's Reva being able to get a second chance at life and find some form of redemption and Kenobi finding peace and getting a happy ending feels like a great place to end my journey with Star Wars, at least for right now. Retrospective videos of what came before Kenobi are always on the table, but at the moment I'm not that interested in Star Wars the way I used to be and there's no use hiding it. The reason my videos have been taking so long to be made is just that I'm tapped out. I, I can't think of anything. I would write scripts, I would edit videos, and then I would just let them sit there. This video has been scripted and edited at least seven times. That's why it's taken, fuck, almost a month to make. Star Wars has always meant something deeply personal to me, and at the moment, ending my journey on a personal note, with one of my favorite characters ending his story with a sense of peace, that feels right for me. So even if this journey with Star Wars had its ups and downs, and even if part of me doesn't want to go, doesn't want to stop, I feel happy and content to start focusing on other things. Because no matter what, I'll always remember my time following Star Wars, and what it meant to me and others like me. So with nothing left to say, Star Wars. Goodbye old friend. May the force be with you. Thank you my friend for sticking around for this extremely long video. It took forever to make, but hopefully you enjoyed it. It's been an interesting journey with this YouTube channel, and I'm hoping to make it even better as time goes on. I know these last couple months have been pretty difficult with all the delays, but I'm in a better place mentally and emotionally right now, and I'm excited to make more content for you guys in the future.
So I hope you stick around. I hope you enjoy what I have to offer. But no matter what you are, a Patreon, a membership subscriber, whatever. Blah, 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 blah. It really is all of you that makes this adventure with it. It really is all of you that makes this journey, that makes this adventure worth it. And I'm glad to have you guys with me. As always, thank you for stopping by the channel. And no matter what time you're watching this video, good morning, good afternoon, good night.